everyone, and welcome to Grace Church. My name is Marnie, and I get to be the kids pastor here at Grace. We're so glad that you're joining us today. VBS is coming up. It will be Monday through Friday, June 28th through July 2nd. We invite your kids to join us on a quest for the King's armor, the armor of God. Head to gracechurch360.org forward slash VBS 2021 to register. Just a quick reminder that we have limited space available, so sign up today. We're also in the process of building our amazing volunteer team. If you're interested in helping out, please reach out to me. We are thrilled to announce that we are now accepting applications for a new group of interns, as well as our new residency program. We are looking for people who want to pursue a life of passionate ministry in God's kingdom. Applications are now open. If you'd like to learn more about this opportunity, head to our website. Another way to learn more is to come to our Interns Project Night. Join us this Tuesday, June 15th, here at the church at 6.30 p.m. to hear directly from our four interns. It's gonna be a great night. This summer, our Young Adults Ministry is hosting a book club. We're excited to read through the book, After Doubt, by A.J. Swoboda. If you're interested in joining us, sign up online today. Summer Book Club will, be, will kick off on June 24th in the backyard. Speaking of the backyard, we're excited to announce that starting July 4th, we will be having our Sunday morning services on the back lawn at 10 a.m. Bring your lawn chair, your friends, and your family. It's gonna be a great time. And for our online community, we will be having our online interactive service at 10 a.m. as well. That's it for announcements. Church, let's pray before we worship. Join me. Father God, we just come before you today. You are so worthy of our praise and our honor and our attention. We set our hearts and our minds on you right now. We give you this morning, we ask you to speak to our hearts and that you would be honored in our worship. We just give you this time, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. See you. 
the promise You're very mighty Begin to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declared the grave Has no claim on me Then came the morning that see the promise from very body began to Well, I want to welcome you. So glad that you're here. My name is Dave. I get to be one of the pastors here at Grace Church, and uh, I just want to welcome you. And for those that are joining us online, again, no matter where you're at, no matter what you're doing, I believe the Lord is with you, and he's wanting to speak to your heart. And that's really what we all desire, the Lord to speak to our hearts. We're in this letter called 1 John, and we're about halfway through and I think it's good from time to time to just step back and remember again who it is who has written this letter. Uh, this is John, who is now an old man. In fact, some, most people think he's in his early 90s. And, and I, can, I can just imagine him remembering back to when he was a young man, when Jesus called him. He was a fisherman, and Jesus called him to follow, follow him. And John left his boat, he left his fishing gear, he left it all behind, and he began to follow Jesus, and it absolutely changed his life. And, and he was there at the very beginning. He experienced uh, the ministry of Jesus. He experienced the miracles, the teaching, uh, the, the, the feeding of the 5,000. He, he experienced all those things, and he also experienced the death of Jesus. He was there when Jesus was crucified. He experienced the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, John experienced all those things. And he also, also saw the beginning of the church and how it began to grow. And it grew not only in Jerusalem, but all throughout Israel, all throughout the world and the message of the gospel continued and he witnessed those who were being persecuted, the threat against the church because of persecution. And, and, and John, John is now the last of the 12 who are alive. The others, most of whom have given their life for the sake of the gospel. And he is now the last one. And there's a new threat that's taking place. And that threat against this church isn't the persecution. It is a wrong teaching. Wrong, wrong teaching that is carrying people away from the 
gospel, the good news of Jesus. And John writes this church that he loves. And that's where we want to pick it up today, thinking about John who is writing to this church that he loves and telling them how to stay on track and stay focused on the gospel. So this is what I'm going to do today to approach the scripture. I'm going to go ahead and read through uh, the uh, verses that we're going to look at today. And then I want to come back and bring some application to those verses. And so here we go. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 is where we're going to begin today. And this is what it says. John's writing to this church and he says, This is the message you have heard from the very beginning. This is foundational. This is the message of the gospel that you first heard. We should love one another. That's a phenomenal place to start. And he goes on and he says this. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. Now, now it's interesting that, that John would go right back to the very beginning story, the story in Genesis. And he talks about Cain and how Cain did not like his brother because his brother actually, actually was righteous. Now, now, we're seeing some of that taking place in the, uh, around us, that people are hating others, not because necessarily they're doing what's wrong, though that's happening, but they're hating pe people because they're doing what is right. And, and sometimes we think that is, that is um, uh, something that's new that's happening, but we see in John that this is actually from the very beginning. You have Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, the first two that were born on this planet. One kills the other because Abel was righteous. And so he, we find ourselves in the same situation that, that people are hating each other because they're righteous. And, and Jesus is saying, don't be surprised about that. What we should be surprised about is, is not that people, that would, the world would hate us. We'd be, we should be surprised when, when other followers of Jesus, when that hate us, that there's hate between brothers and sisters in Christ. That should surprise us. Now, now I want to go on. It goes on and says this. We know that we have passed from death to light because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. And anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. It goes on and says this. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. The scripture goes on and goes, says this. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he has commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he gives us. That's how we know. Now, I'm, I, I, I think it would be good if we just stopped right now and, and prayed. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the scripture. I ask that in these moments that you would help me and that you'd help all of us hear the whisper of the Holy Spirit, that we'd hear from you. I ask, O oh Lord, that you would work in our lives as, as the scripture comes to us. Help, us. help us to hear it. Help us to do it. Help us to be people who focus on you. I ask for your blessing in these moments. In the name of Jesus, amen. 
I'm calling this this teaching today, love, love is a verb. And, and the reality is that love really does have action to it. Uh, this, is a, this truth is really a continuation of the truth and the reality of this. God is love. God is the definition of love. He is the source of love. He's the definer of love. God is love. And, and we always need to start with, with God. If we're going to talk about this subject of love as an action, we, we don't start with the action. We start with God. We've got to start there foundationally. I, I don't start with me. I don't start with you. I don't start with the things that we do. I don't start with the problem We've got to start with God. That's where it's a healthy start. And this idea of, of love as an action is a continuation of really where we began last week. At the very beginning of this chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, that says this, How great the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. And all that we do is based on who we are. Uh, the lavished love of the Father that he calls me his child. And, and I need to be his child and live as his child. My, my doing comes from my being. Just like my, my being, as I am his child, I live in righteousness and I live in justice and justice and righteousness is the way that I am to live and we looked at that last week and and that being his child and knowing his love I I want to I want to turn away from sin and I want to live in righteousness and as I am his child I receive his love and I'm doing his love and that's where love becomes a verb. And, and so I think it's great that John now takes us right to the very beginning, as we've already read in, in verse 11, that love is a command, not an option. It's not something we can just do or not do. It, it, it really is a command. It's something that we're called to do. And and John says it. This is the message you've heard from the very beginning. This is not some new idea. This is not something that is, is random. This is the central message of the gospel, that, that we should be people that love one another. Uh, let me, let us, let, we, let's look at what Jesus says. It's recorded in the gospel of John ver, ver, chapter 13. And he says this, a new commandment, Jesus is speaking, by the way, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. And, and then he says this amazing statement. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By this, by this reality that the that there's an affection, there's a love that we have, there's action and movement for one another. And by that, not by our buildings, not by our programs, not by anything else, but by this, by our love for one another, everybody's going to know you're one of my followers. Now again, I mentioned it earlier as I read through that section of Scripture. Don't, don't be surprised when the people hate you because of righteousness. What should surprise us, though, and what should be something not happening is that we don't have love for each other, that there's a hatred towards each other. And, and I think in this last season, through all the things that have taken place over this last year, we've seen this where people have, have not liked each other. They've hated each other. And, and I know that's a strong word, but at the same time, I've seen that and, and observed that. And, and, and yet the command of the Lord Jesus is that we're, we would be people who love one another. And in fact, John goes on and, and says, not only is that a command, that love is actual, actually the outward proof for the inward change. That if you are somebody who's put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that there's been an inward change. And out of that inward change, there's an outward proof. There's a, a reality that people can actually see. 
And he says that in 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse 14. Uh, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love, actually, they're still in death. They're, they're still in the place of death. They haven't entered into life. James writes this and. The brother of John, by the way, is James, and he writes this in his letter. Religion that God, our Father, accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And, and, and I think that phrase, being polluted by the world, so often we think of, well, that must be sin or doing things wrong. But, but I, I want to suggest it's more than that. It it's really has to do with an attitude of selfishness and self-centeredness and that we're polluted by what's the most important thing is, number one, that's me and watch out for me and all that kind of stuff. The I-centered idea that I'm the focus of the universe kind of thing. That's the pollution of this world. And James writes this very practical thing about Listen, this is what needs to happen. Taking care of widows, taking care of orphans, doing what's just and right, doing something that would touch people around it, us. And, and, and love, doing that is really, truly the outward proof of the inward change, change that's taken place. Love, this love that we're talking about, has an example to follow. It, it's not like he gives us uh, the idea or command to love and then gives us no idea how to do it. He, he really does give us the example and Jesus himself is that example. So when I'm talking about love being an action, love is a verb, love is doing something. That, that so often, again, we get our focus on the doing when we really need to keep our eyes on Jesus, the example. Keep our eyes on him. Jesus said this. He, he consistently said this. Come, follow me. Follow me. And, and I think about, sometimes I think about this, you know, how do I love people? How do I do this? And it gets so big when the realization of, of Jesus, when he says, come, follow me, he he, he calls me to something I can do. I can follow him. And, and that's what he's called us to do. That he's our example and we are called to follow him. John chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3 verse 16. We know, uh, this is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our life to our, 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 for our brothers. It's this idea that we're just doing what Jesus did. Uh, I love this verse out of the Gospel of John, chapter 20, where Jesus has been resurrected and he is giving his, his disciples assignment. And, and Jesus said to them, peace be with you as the Father has sent me. Now I'm sending you. With that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. I, I know when I think about following the example of Jesus, that, that I need the strength I need the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I, I can do it on my own for a season. However, I quickly run out of energy. I need the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And, and as Jesus calls us to follow him, he gives us the resource to follow him. And that is the very presence of the Holy Spirit himself. 
Now, now Paul writes these words uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, and he starts off this way, be imitators of God. I don't, I don't know about you, but I, I, I read that, and it, it just sets me back. I start thinking, oh, great, God is our example. We are to imitate God. And, and how in the world can I do that? Well, it's interesting because Paul actually is saying exactly what John said uh, in this same chapter. He says, as dearly loved children. It comes back to this foundational idea that I need to know that I am a child who is loved by God. And from that position of, of sonship, of, of, of being a child of God, as a dearly loved child, that I live a life of love. Action comes out of who I am. What I am then starts to do its work. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That, that Jesus truly is our example and we're to follow him. And we're following him as a, as a child of his, loved by him. And as people are, who are resourced by the Holy Spirit himself. Now, now love really is more than just an attitude or an emotion. Although it can have attitude to it and it can have emotion to it, it also has to do with action. There has to be movement, movement to it. Uh, John writes this in verses 17 and 18. He says, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him. Uh, it's an interesting phrase, has no pity on him. The, the idea of pity really is, is something where there is an emotional change that takes place in your gut. You're, you feel it on the inside. In other words, you, you see your, pers- your, your brother in need and there's something that moves you. There's some emotion that takes place. There's a, there's this affection towards them and there's this uh, connection or, or attachment, I should say, or, or th- somehow just describing the, the whole idea of, of it really does move, move me. Because here's the deal. We're, we're being bombarded constantly with bad news. We get bad news on the internet. We get bad news on the news. I mean, it's constantly coming at us. Bad news, bad news, bad news. And we see people in need over here and over there. We see these big problems, all these things. And what happens is we start to feel numb. The, the bad news doesn't affect us anymore. We're, there's, there's nothing that, uh, that really changes our emotion, as it were. We just, we just get numb to all of it. And... John's writing and saying, listen, when you see your brother in need, you you need to have pity. There needs to be something that actually moves you inside. Something of emotion, something of, of something that's stirring in your life. How can the love of God be in him? Dear children, Let us not love with words or tongue, but with action and in truth. When we see the problems that are around us, when we see all that's taking place, uh, it's, it's so easy just to add our voice and just make statements. But I think it would be so much better to maybe not say so much and just simply do something. Not just add to the rhetoric, but step into people's situation, their circumstance, and to do something and to love them. And that goes to this big idea where that's what Jesus did. The gospel summed up in John 3.16. For God so loved the world he gave. There was action to his love. Loves, he loved the worlds he gave his son that whoever believes in him shall, shall not perish but have eternal life. That Jesus came and gave himself for the world. Not just for a select few, not for a, a, a chosen group. 
he gave his life for the world. No matter what country, no matter what culture, no matter what language, Jesus died for the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight, rich or poor. It doesn't matter where you've come from in, the, in this planet. The bottom line, Jesus gave his life for the world. And because of that, we see his action and we're to do something. God so loved the world he gave. And the reality is this, love will cost me something. It'll cost me something. Now, now, right about now, somebody's thinking, okay, he's going to ask for a big offering right now. It's going to cost you something. Okay, get your checkbooks out. That's for my generation. Get your checkbook out. Or for any, maybe anybody under, uh, you know, my age would be, you know, get your texting out or, you know, send it in some other form. But here's the bottom line. That's the easy part. It's easy to give money. In fact, there's many, many that would just prefer to give money. Uh, let me just give some, let me write a check. Let me send some money. Let me just do that. I just don't want to get involved. I don't want to step into somebody else's world. I, I don't want to, I don't want to really uh, get my emotions caught up into that situation. I, I, I don't want to, here it is, spend the most precious thing I have, a thing that I want to keep for myself, a thing I call time. I don't want to spend my time doing that. If we're going to love, it will cost us. And I'm not talking about dollars. I'm talking about it's going to cost us emotion, emotions. It's going to cost attachment. It's going to cost some time. Because when you step into somebody else's world, when you go to where people are in need, you're going to be finding yourself in a situation where you're going to get face to face with somebody. You're going to hear their story. And in hearing their story, you're going to be moved to action. Love always costs us something. That's why Paul writes and says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Love is an action. Love is a verb. Love will move and love will cost us something. And love does something else though. And that's this. L loving others actually draws us closer to God. There's something that we just get closer to him when we're loving other people. We sense his presence. We know his strength and his power. There's something about the very presence of God himself that is in, in, in us and in the situation when we're loving and doing something of love with someone else. I love this section of scripture. It says this, this is, this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. By the way, that verse uh, change there is unfortunate because it's, uh, it's actually the same sentence. It says, uh, and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. This is uh, one of my favorite sections of scripture, one of my favorite verses because I've experienced this so many times where I see the problem, I see the big idea, I see all those things and, and then I start condemning myself and feeling condemned because I'm not doing enough or I'm not doing this and I start wondering as I, even as I read that first section about helping your brother and not having pity and I start to wonder okay do I empty my bank accounts what do I do you know I sell my houses house houses I have one house uh, you know what do I do and I start to condemn myself but here's the deal Jesus never condemns us we can actually set our hearts at rest in his presence. It draws us closer to God. Because you know what? 
He knows everything. He knows my heart. He, he knows if I'm doing something because I'm selfish or I'm trying to get uh, earn points with him or earn points with somebody else. What is the motive of why I'm doing what I'm doing? Am I really doing it out of love or am I doing it out of obligation or some other reason? He knows everything. See, this verse is really about continuing in a relationship with God who is my father who loves me and he loves me and I love him and in that love relationship I'm simply wanting to do what God is doing I want to follow him I want to continue in this relationship with Jesus and to me these verses are all about a relationship with Jesus when I go to pray I've got to be honest with him because he knows my heart. He knows what's truly going on. He leads me. He directs me. He knows what's truly taking place. Scripture goes on and he says, dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, In other words, if we're at rest in his presence and we're in a relationship with him and we're following him and our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence before God. Uh, I can stand before him in confidence and boldness, knowing he loves me, I'm received by him, knowing there's no falsehood between me and him, I'm confident before God. And when I stand confident before God, I can stand confident before my enemy. I stand confident before God and receive from him everything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another. Here it is again. Love one another as his command. I stand before him. I can be confident before him. And now... You might be thinking, well, wait a minute. Aren't we talking about love being an action and love being a verb? And now you're talking about prayer. And what we're really talking about is a holistic big idea of me being his child in relationship with him. And because of that, I want righteousness. And because of that, I'm following him and doing what Jesus is doing. And because of that, I'm loving uh, my brothers and sisters around me and expressing and doing love. This is talking about a relationship with him. When we're talking about love being a verb, I'm talking about, and John's talking about, a relationship with him. Scripture goes on. It says, those who obey his commands live in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know by the spirit he gave us. We started last week with first. John chapter 3, verse 1. How great the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And from that, he said, we live righteously, we live just in justice, we want righteousness and justice, we live in that. Then he says, love is a verb, we need to be people who love one another. And the next thing, which is what we'll pick up next time we look at 1 John, is this big idea that the Holy Spirit is placed in us. Folks, when I read this section, it really does set me back and say, okay, Lord, where do I start? To, To love others, to help people in need, where do I start? Well, we start with God. And we start with what he's doing. And we say, Lord, I want to be a part of what you're doing in this world. And oh, by the way, Lord, what you're doing in my world today. And when I go out into this world and I come across people and I see people that, that I'm just not, I'm not numb to what's taking place. In fact, I'm moved by what's taking place. And I, I, Take some steps. Move with action. Step into people's world. 
And throughout the week, throughout the day, throughout the week, I say, Lord, I want to be a part of what you're doing today. You see, Monday or Tuesday will be around people who are calling upon the name of the Lord. There, something's taken place, something's happened, and they'll express something, and you'll recognize they're actually searching for God. And instead of just going on about your day, that you take the step into that situation and you love them. Jesus has called us to be, to be Jesus in this world because we're his kids. Because we're his kids, we follow him. Grace Church, I want us to be a church. I want to be a person who loves those who God has placed in my life and who, who I find every day of the week. I, I want to be that person. And I pray that God will give me the strength and he will do that and he'll give you the strength as as we follow him. Let's pray, can we? Lord, I thank you for the fact that you are an amazing God. I thank you that you call us your children. Now, Lord, I pray that we would live as your children, that we do what you are doing, that we would be people empowered by the Holy Spirit and that we would love. Lord, the places we have been fighting and arguing and bickering and Lord, I pray that you would help us to turn from those things and to love one another. I ask, O oh Lord, for your grace, your power, your strength. I ask, O oh Lord, for your favor in these days. And I pray for a boldness to love one another in your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you for joining us online today. We would love to connect with you. If you have any questions or would like more information, let us know in the chat or visit gracechurch360.org. Another way to connect with us is on Instagram or Facebook. Grace Church, I hope you have a great day.